Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 103, Lost and Loss. Last time, after Lloyd George stepped down as Prime Minister, Winston was one of the many incumbents to lose his seat during the following election of November 15, 1922. Dundee decided to move away from the man who seemed to be able to take on international issues and make a difference, but at the expense of his district. He was 47 years old. The majority of the newspapers had no trouble in kicking Winston on his way down. The Daily Mail wrote, quote, Mr. Churchill has had as many lives as the proverbial cat, but the indictment against him is a long one, unquote. Balancing this out was the Daily Telegraph, never a Churchill supporter, which inked, quote, The House of Commons loses for a time its most brilliant and dazzling speaker. His is perhaps the most sensational defeat of the whole election, unquote. Their view of, for a time, was correct, of course. Winston was not a man to be kept down. But the two years he was out of office would be in his best interest though he certainly didn't feel that way at the time. It may have mollified Churchill, which is doubtful, that the vast majority of those that voted were rejecting members of the current government, that is, except for the conservatives. The country was ready to give them a chance to run the show once more. So, as things stood now, the Tories had 345 seats, Labour 142, which meant they were now the opposition. Labour had indeed come a long way, which left Lloyd George's Liberals and Asquith's Liberals with fewer, even totaled, than Labour. Neither man would ever live at 10 Downing again. But Winston was more than just a beaten politician. By now, he was an institution, who had dozens of seats offered to him the very next day. This political cat would, in time, land on his feet. But for now, as he told those that wrote to him, all he wanted was rest. And where better to rest than the Riviera, where Winston rented a villa and let his physical and political scars heal. The family came to him at Christmas and New Year's, and all had a grand time. And this is just too cute to pass up. When on the beach, Winston ran into a painter who told him to paint. That was what he was doing in trying to forget the war. Then he asked the hobble Churchill what he was doing. Winston replied, writing a book about the war. The painter was shocked and replied, that was like digging up a cemetery. Winston rejoined, yes, but with a resurrection. One can only assume he meant his. Winston's defeat turned self-imposed exile slash recuperation came at a fortuitous time. He wrote to his friends in February of 1923 that he was getting better, which prompted a response from most of them that they needed his help in the House. But Churchill could see that the plummeting government wasn't finished falling quite yet. He would wait some more. The reason for this downward spiral was that, for all the maneuvering Von Law had done to get to number 10, turns out he wasn't quite big enough for the chair. The public was glad that Bonar Law was not Lloyd George, but other than that ability, owing solely to his parentage, Law got little done. The stress got to him, the man turned ill, and stepped down, not quite making it six months. Now, it was Stanley Baldwin's turn, who turned out to be something of a political animal with fair instincts. He took the reins in May 1923. But Baldwin believed that the best way to beat high unemployment, the country's main issue, was by high tariffs. Yet, that's not what Law, his predecessor, ran and won on. So Baldwin's hands were tied. If he wanted to carry his own policy forward, it would have to be under his own banner. So, another general election was held that November of 1923. The issue this time was, could free trade help Britain's economy and all those on the island looking for work, which did the trick for Winston, the free trade advocate, as he raised his head and the rest of him to launch himself back into the rough and tumble of politics. 
That November 19th, Churchill accepted the candidacy of the West Leicester Liberal Association. That was his first mistake. West Leicester, east of Birmingham, was almost as blue-collar as Dundee, and Winston had refused several safe seats to go after this one. His next stumble, and here he ignored Clemmy as she whispered into his ear, Don't do this, was agreed to meet with Lloyd George. The former Prime Minister wasn't any more popular than when he left office, and was, in fact, trying to get some of Winston's luster to rub off on him. Even though Winston was back in robust health, he never really got a chance to tell the constituents of Leicester all he could do for them. Their hatred of him, for real or imagined reasons, was visceral. People spat on his car. Hecklers followed him everywhere. One young man threw a brick at Winston's head, and when the police hauled him away, the crowd was even more disgusted with the politician. But in the end, all that mattered was that labor was gaining ground. Not enough to beat the Tories, but still, the people's voice was growing, which left the liberals still in third. It must be said that Winston, the liberal candidate, did better than his party. At least he came in second, losing to the Labour candidate. But second place doesn't count, any more than third, which Churchill narrowly avoided. The Tory majority was now reduced to 87 seats, but they still held. But the slippery slope of Britain's political landscape was just beginning. This loss of prestige for Prime Minister Baldwin also lost him a vote of confidence. And seeing his moment, Asquith joined his Liberals with Labour's Ramsay MacDonald, who, the result being, became Labour's first Prime Minister. Churchill reacted to Asquith's treachery, as he saw it, by quitting the Liberal Party. Now, an unaffiliated politician, when a by-election was held soon after, everyone asked, what would Winston do? The Liberal door was close to him, but what about the Tories? They made it known that if Winston repented publicly, they would support him for the seat in Abbey. But this never came off, as Winston and the Tories held their pride more dear than a rapprochement, which left him, option number three, to run as an independent. Soon out of the woodwork came Winston's friends to rally round him. Quote, I began to receive all kinds of support, dukes, jockeys, prize fighters, courtiers, actors, and businessmen, all developed a keen partisanship. The chorus girls of Dolly's Theater sat up all night addressing the envelopes. Unquote. And Winston was his usual energetic self. But again, the timing of his political views did not align with those of the voters. Well, not enough of them. The election was held March 10, 1924. Winston lost by 73 votes. Churchill may have been dejected by this, which he certainly was, but he had impressed the conservatives. The man with no real organization, nor backed by a major party, had almost won, just from his own octoritas and oratory. The eyes of the Tories focused in on Winston once again. This focus manifested itself when Winston was later invited to speak before the Liverpool Conservatives at their annual convention. Now he had to choose where did his future lay. Winston summed up his answer this way, quote, Anyone can rat, but it takes a certain amount of ingenuity to re-rat, unquote. It must be said that this series has never taken the time to physically describe the subject of our narrative, and I have chosen a poor time to start. That fall of 1923, Winston turned 50 and looked every inch of it. He was round, his face owning a certain number of wrinkles, his head showing more skin than hair. In short, he was becoming the essence of all those pictures and posters that were to come with the next great war. But at that moment, his uniform, if you will, was set. The cigar, the blue polka dot bow tie, and the gold-tipped walking stick. And as much as Winston was synonymous with the House of Commons, just because he wasn't in it for a period doesn't mean he wasn't out and about. If anything, Churchill was even more engaged with life 
politics, and his various interests, if only because he had more time to devote to them. He went back to flying until a crash that he was able to walk away from, in more ways than one. He still played polo, but after breaking his collarbone recently, was seen less and less on the field. When not in public, Winston carried on with his enormous correspondence with friends and allies, and even a few enemies. Of course, he continued to write, which continued to keep the family out of the poorhouse. And then there was the painting, which caused the man to turn inward to its greatest degree, which is probably when he was at his most fascinating. Alas, we will never see that for ourselves. That is, except for when he was being a father. Remembering the indifference his father showed to him, Winston was determined that would not be repeated. So, for the children, there were Winston-designed games of gorilla and bear. He played charades with them, he read to them, he told them stories by the fire, all the while giving them new nicknames. By 1921, Diana, the oldest, age 12, was christened the Gold Cream Kitten. Randolph, his heir, age 10, was the rabbit. Sarah, age 7, was the bumblebee, which left Marigold, age 2, the duckadilly. Unfortunately, duckadilly would never see a third birthday. As is universal, the duckadilly, being the youngest, had the run of the house and her parents' heart. Marigold heard the word no fewer times than her siblings, but that winter she had taken ill twice. So when the weather improved, the family rented a seaside cottage at Broadstairs and ensconced the duckadilly. But she fell ill again. By August 14, 1921, she came down with septicemia, and the governess delayed in calling in a doctor. The physician, upon examining the child, told the young lady to contact the parents. Clementine got there first and told her husband to come quick, which he did by the next train. On Monday, August 22nd, the duckadilly seemed to be rebounding, but then, two days later, took a turn for the worse. In bed, the weakened child asked her mother to sing Bubbles to her. The song had been engraved in everyone's memory as the child sang it non-stop for hours each day. Clementine tried, but couldn't finish the first verse. Marigold let her mother off the hook by whispering, Not tonight, finish tomorrow. But the next day, the child passed away. She was only two years and nine months old. Winston and Clementine stayed by the child's side long after. Clementine, and it's possible she'd never realized this for the rest of her life, shrieked like a demon, then never spoke of the child's death again. This is only known because Winston, much later, told Mary, their last child, born soon after. And as best as she could, Mary the Mouse filled her parents' hearts and lives with love. Sadly, there were two more deaths that followed hard upon, Clementine's grandmother and Winston's mother, Jenny. But Jenny's death was as unusual as her life had been. Aged 67, Jenny, who still lived her life to the fullest, was inadvisedly running down a flight of stairs in equally inadvisable high-heeled Italian shoes. But still three steps shy of the bottom, she tripped, fell, and broke her leg. Ordered to rest, something hard for the effervescent lady to do, two weeks into the immobile stage, gangrene was detected. Winston sent for a surgeon, who recommended immediate amputation. Without missing a beat, the lady replied, well, she would just have to learn to put her best foot forward. The surgery done, after another two-week interval, the femoral artery hemorrhaged, just after breakfast. Soon after, she slipped into a coma and then died. She breathed her last before noon. Winston, when he was told of her condition, rushed over in his pajamas and was with her at the end. Later, he wrote, quote, She suffers no more pain, nor will she ever know old age, decrepitude, loneliness. I wish you could have seen her as she lay at rest, after all the sunshine and storm of life 
was over. Very beautiful and splendid she looked. Unquote. She was laid to rest next to Lord Randolph, and long after everyone had departed, Winston stood there by her open grave, only leaving after he tossed in crimson roses. Hi, this is Nathaniel Lloyd, host of the podcast about historical myths and misconceptions, historical blindness. I'm here to tell you that maybe you've already earned that fun you keep putting off, thinking you don't quite deserve it yet. Maybe fun should be on your to-do list and not at the bottom of it, since we never seem to reach the end of those lists these days. Prioritize yourself and add some diversion and enjoyment to your daily routine with Best Fiends, the puzzle adventure game you can play anytime, anywhere. I'm on level 145 and I can tell you, it's so easy to pick up and play between tasks, even if you've only got a few minutes free. You can play offline, even when you're out and about with no Wi-Fi, and you'll always find new fiends to collect and new levels to beat, and seasonal challenges too, like the ongoing Season of Seas, in which you can earn rewards by completing tasks. You've earned your fun time. Now go to the App Store or Google Play to download Best Fiends for free. Plus, earn even more with $5 worth of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's friends without the R. Best fiends. But life, as they say, is for the living. Everyone had to go on. Churchill stayed busy with his writing, if only to keep at bay the wolf at the door. Most cold mornings, he would work on whatever manuscript from breakfast until noon. But as the warmer days came, he would alter his day by horse riding in the morning and then riding in the middle of the day and then painting in the afternoon. The man, like his mother, lived every day of his life. Clementine pursued life as well, but also raised the children. Winston's schedule stemmed from the care of his family, as he and Clementine knew the household was clothed and fed from one book to the next. Occasionally, he would write to Clemmy as a new article or book was requested of him, We shall not starve. But soon enough, that fear seemed about to vanish forever, as word got out that Winston's next book would be about the war, and everyone who had anything to do with the direction of the conflict ran and hid, lest they remind Churchill that they existed. But the hushed whispers, or shouts of incredulity, were equally about the money. His advance was £9,000. There was another 5000 for the American rights. The London Times offered a bit more than that for the serial rights in the UK. The original idea was to deliver the two-volume work by December 31st, 1922. But this is Churchill we're talking about. Eventually, it would be a five-volume work, just over 2,500 pages, and take eight years to produce. But it was worth the wait. Then politics re-entered Winston's life. That is... Winston, the writer. Bonar Law, when still in office, lashed onto the idea that if Winston was quoting government documents, then he was clearly abusing his access to cabinet-level information. This argument came up again and again with the release of each volume. But Hankey, the cabinet secretary, won the first battle for Winston by telling Law that others had written books about Kitchener, Jellicoe, and Fisher, used first-hand accounts, and no one railed against them. The case, more or less, was closed. As the first volume was about to come out to print, a title still had to be worked out. This was around January 1922. Finally, after many silly suggestions, Scribner, the publisher, made a suggestion and won the argument. It would be called The World Crisis. The book was released. Sales flew high into the sky as did the criticisms. Quote, Winston has written an enormous book about himself and called it the world crisis, unquote. One friend wrote, Balfour offered up Churchill's, quote, autobiography disguised as a history of the universe, unquote. Not bad. Not until 1927 did written criticisms appear, but their arguments were weak and possibly held various amounts of envy. The world crisis is indeed comprehensive and more or less objective. 
But more than that, it puts the reader in the battle. You are, whether you want to be or not, amid the trenches, the squalor, and death surrounds you. And when many had finished the fifth and final volume, they couldn't help but feel a friend had passed away to share their days no more. Here's a passage from Churchill's book, After the Battle of the Psalm. Struggling forward through the mire and filth of the trenches, across the corpse-strewn crater fields, amid the flaring, crashing, blasting barrages, and murderous machine gun fire, conscious of their race, proud of their cause, they seized the most formidable soldiery in Europe by the throat, slew them, and hurled them unceasingly backward. If two or ten lives were required by their commander to kill one German, no word of complaint ever rose from the fighting troops. No attack, however forlorn, however fatal, found them without ardor. No slaughter, however desolating, prevented them from returning to the charge. No physical conditions, however severe, deprived their commanders of their obedience and loyalty. Martyrs, not less than soldiers, they fulfilled the high purpose of duty with which they were imbued. There's something I wanted to share with you uh, that I left out just because I wasn't sure how to stick it into the narrative. Um, Churchill always delighted in having guests over. Whether he was in an in office or not, uh, he always wanted people to come over who were intelligent, who could keep up with him, whether they were playing games or having a serious discussion or argument. But he loved intelligent people to be over for dinner. And I just had to give you an example of this. One evening after dinner, there was a professor, F.A. Lindman, who was simply called the prof. And back in 1916, um, the RAF pilots were dying daily in nosedives. They just could not figure out how to bring their plane out of a dive. So the prof, working with just paper and a pencil or whatever, figured out a formula on how to pull the plane out of a dive each time. And, and all the pilots said that, you know, there's no way you can't work that out on paper. It doesn't work that way. So the prof learned, taught himself how to fly, went up, put the plane into a dive on purpose, used his formula pulled himself out successfully, and his formula or his tactic became standard learning at the RAF schools. So I thought that was pretty amazing. So one night, the prof is over at Churchill's after dinner, and Churchill says to him, Prof, tell us in words of one syllable, and in no longer than five minutes, what is the quantum theory? And Winston produced his gold watch. Lindman did it, and the entire family burst into applause after he was all done. So he just loved having these intelligent type of people around, and he wasn't afraid to spar with them. There was another um, glimpse into Winston's world when someone introduced him to a young man who was turning 25 that very evening. And uh, Winston, with a twinkle in his eye, said, You know, Napoleon conquered Toulon before he was 25 at age 25. Quick, go to Toulon, hurry and capture it. So he just had this really wonderful sense of humor, and he just loved to um, show off, but also to have others of equal intelligence around him. So believe it or not, on the last episode, I actually mispronounced a word, um, and I got a nice email from Joey in Ireland uh, who was nice enough to correct me, and I said, well, if you're so smart – no, I didn't say that uh, – why don't you send me uh, a recording of the correct pronunciation? And But really, it was just an excuse to hear his accent because I think the Irish accent's cool. So anyway, here's Joey to correct some of my mistakes. Greetings from Dublin, Ireland. Hello there, Ray. This is Joey. How are you doing? So I'll just sending this uh, with a couple of very, very minor uh, pronunciation corrections from the last episode regarding Winston uh, and his involvement with Ireland. The first one just being uh, the name for Ireland in Irish, which the country was referred to at the time, uh, was Era, not Erie, like you were saying, which is, I presume you got that from Lake Erie, which is spelt very same, except there's a fada over the e in Irish, a fada being like an accent in the Gaelic language. So I can't blame you for that at all. But anyway, it's Erda. So then the next one was just the leader of the Republican anti-treaty side in Ireland, who the man who had Winston's friend Michael Collins assassinated, and that is Eamon de Valera. You were saying de Valera, which is actually great. I'm going to use that for now on because it's great. 
And he, he actually got the name from, he was born in New York to a Cuban father and an Irish mother. And on his birth cert, it actually said George de Valero, which was later corrected to Edward de Valera. And when his father died, he was moved back to Ireland and he later changed it to Eamon during the Gaelic revival, which uh, Eamon being, you know, like an Irish version of Edward. And He's very, a very divisive figure, De Valera. He would go on to become the leader of the country after the Irish Civil War. And he'd bring in stuff like, you know, the most strict censorship laws in Western Europe, apparently, at the time. Uh, very conservative. And he was hated by some, loved by others, like my grandparents. My grandfather was actually in his political party, and they would have known De Valera. And to this day, my grandmother has a framed photo of him in her kitchen, which to think of an Irish politician being, you know, framed, photographed of them in someone's house is unbelievable and hilarious. And just to tie it around to World War II, I suppose, uh, I think Zach uh, might have talked about this when he was on, but De Valera actually sent condolences to the Nazi party when Hitler died uh, at the end of the war, which obviously raised a few eyebrows, as you can imagine, but um, probably just, you know, a sly dig at the English, um, because there were still very, very real scars from the the Irish War of Independence at that stage. So, uh, yeah, I think that's about it. Thanks for giving me this time, Ray, Um, and I should just point out that Ray encouraged me to send this. I'm I'm not some sort of madman who just finds things to correct on podcasts and sends in my own audio. So, thanks, Ray. Keep the good work and i'll keep listening cheers thanks bye bye and i can't say goodbye until i say hi to my latest members so welcome aboard timothy w from redland bay australia brian m from toronto canada jeff r from dafter michigan and kelly m from madison wisconsin and thank you to elizabeth s from pauline's island south carolina for her donation and that's my home state so Thank you, Elizabeth. Oh, and one last thing before I let you go. So we're almost finished with Churchill, and I thought it would be fun to end this series. Not that I had planned on going this far with it. Um, When we do our very last uh, Churchill, which is coming up soon, we're going to have another coffee mug drawing. But this time I'm going to give away five Churchill or FDR mugs, whichever one you would like. So just please send me uh, an email to wwiipodcast at gmail.com. Enter, maybe put contest in the subject to make it nice and easy for me. I need all the help I can get. And I'll have my daughters draw out the five winners when we do our last episode on Churchill and get back to the war, which is coming up soon. So I will see you in a couple of days with the next episode. I'm going to try and do shorter episodes and get them out quicker and see how that goes. So as always... Take care, everyone.